I'm Danny Wedding, and I'm director of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health, uh, located in St. Louis. And for the past few years, MIMH has been working closely with St. Louis University in two different research projects investigating fetal alcohol syndrome and the prevention of FAS. The principal investigator on both of those projects has been Dr. Mark Mengel with the School of Medicine at St. Louis University. And Mark, thanks for joining us today. Sure. Uh, you're chairman of the Department of Community and Family Medicine. Right. And I know how, how very demanding that job is and how busy you must be. And, and how is it that you wound up becoming passionate about fetal alcohol syndrome? Well, I think several things. Um, early in my academic career, um, I was involved in a project that looked at pregnancy outcomes and tried to predict, um, in this case, what, are some of the, what were some of the family issues that led to adverse pregnancy outcomes. And through that project, I learned that uh, many of the things that lead to adverse pregnancy outcomes weren't really being addressed from a prevention standpoint within clinical practice. Yeah. So when I came to St. Louis and there was an opportunity available through the CDC to work on fetal alcohol syndrome, um, along with you and others, uh -huh. we seemed to be able to form a good team and address the issue. So I really sort of picked back up from an interest I had earlier in my career, I'm very interested in prevention. I think fetal alcohol syndrome is actually a bigger problem than what the literature may suggest, mainly because alcohol has such devastating effects to infants' brains without affecting the face. So sure. as a clinician, you can't really see it until a child starts going, doesn't meet their developmental milestones. And so... I became actually very interested in it as I was reading more about it. And the projects just allowed me to um, exploit that interest, I guess, with a good group of people. Well, hasn't that interest <clears throat> led you to uh, being on some fairly high-level working groups for CDC? Yeah, it's actually surprising <laughs> that there's not. <laughs> um, the community of scholars that are interested in FAS is rather small, uh -huh. actually. And so because I'm interested in prevention, that's even a smaller community. Yeah. Um, there was an opportunity uh, to serve on an advisory board with the CDC recently, and I took advantage of that. And okay. Well, we're glad you're there. Thanks. I, I, before getting involved with this project, I always sort of naively thought that FAS was a problem that pediatricians dealt with and, right. and pretty much pediatricians only, but that's not the case, is it? No, you'd think it would be because FAS, of course, occurs in children, and pediatricians uh -huh. are the predominant group of health care providers that care for children in this country, although there's certainly other primary care physicians who care for children, like family physicians, mm -hmm. uh, physician's assistants and nurse practitioners. But if you're really looking at it from a prevention perspective, the health care providers who provide care to women are actually critical. Sure. Because it's the women who drink that leads to fetal alcohol syndrome and other fetal alcohol syndrome spectrum disorders, as it's now called. And then to care for children with FAS, it actually turns out you need a wide range of health care providers on an interdisciplinary team um, to help prevent the secondary disabilities associated with fetal alcohol syndrome. So it really crosses a number of different disciplines. What kind of working relationship would a family medicine doctor have with a dysmorphologist? Would you uh, always pull the dysmorphologist in or, or just as needed? Well, I think there is a there is a pretty sophisticated differential diagnosis associated with FAS. So while as a family doc or a pediatrician or a nurse practitioner, we could probably recognize the facial characteristics and maybe recognize that a child hasn't met a certain developmental milestone or has behavioral difficulties that are associated with alcohol, um, then we should probably send the person to a dysmorphologist or a geneticist just to work through the differential because it is complex. And then once the diagnosis is confirmed and established, you'd pick up care for that patient. Right. You could pick up care and organize the team, mm -hmm. essentially. Do, do you think that, that, that doctors in general do a pretty good job of identifying uh, women who are at risk during pregnancy and who may have an alcohol-exposed pregnancy? Yeah. The literature certainly suggests we don't, you know, that we don't routinely screen for alcohol use in our clinical practice. Certainly, there are primary care physicians who do a good job. Usually, they've received additional training or they're passionate about the field. There was a good study done by uh, Mike Fleming and his colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, which showed that we're trainable, actually. You can train primary care physicians 
to screen for alcohol use, huh? identify the specific pattern of alcohol use a woman has, and then apply what's called a brief intervention to that population. And it does result in significant reductions in drinking. So it is possible. There are a lot of reasons why it hasn't occurred. I mean, financial issues, time issues, but it is work that we are capable of doing and can do. And, and of course, you're leading the uh, uh, Midwest Regional FAS Training Center, the Mr. Fastic right. program. And I guess the key component of that is educating physicians and other health care providers. Absolutely. As you know, there's a, a lot of knowledge deficits among health care providers about fetal alcohol syndrome, particularly some of the newer research findings. Mm -hmm. So the CDC is very interested in getting the word out about FAS, how to recognize it and diagnosis, but, diagnose it, but more importantly, how to treat it and how to prevent it. And so the Mr. Fastic team, which includes you <laughs> and many others here, is really looking at a wide range of healthcare providers in terms of educating them about the latest in fetal alcohol syndrome. And then um, we're going to take these trainees, we're calling them, and we hope they'll go out and educate their colleagues in this six-state region mm -hmm. um, that we're managing for the CDC. And, and I know you're, you're through the Mr. Fastic program, all of us will be focusing on educating providers about FAS, but, but also teaching some communication skills and, right. and in general, what does the literature say about uh, physicians and their ability to educate and uh, communicate with patients? Well, here too, while there's certainly primary care physicians who are excellent communicators, the literature suggests that many primary care physicians have deficits in their communication skills. And so uh -huh. since in prevention work, communication and education is just so critical, we are going to inform our trainees and hopefully they'll inform their colleagues about the latest in communication research. Um, been a lot of good research over the past 10 years. While it has made it into the medical school curriculum, there are a lot of practitioners out there that weren't exposed to this research. Communication skills are so linked to good outcomes that it really is something that we have to talk with them about. Okay. Now, of course, the best way to learn communication skills is in a workshop where you're <laughs> practicing the skill. Where you get to actually communicate. Right. <laughs> so this is a first step. Huh? I see it. Well, well Mark, uh, this, this uh, tape that we're making will be uh, presented to a number of uh, physicians and physician groups and CE programs, and I'd like to sort of wrap up by giving you an opportunity to talk to your fellow physicians and, and give a, perhaps a, a take-home message about FAS. Certainly. Yeah, I, I just encourage physicians who uh, are participating in this effort or watching this tape to really maintain an open mind about fetal alcohol syndrome. It occurs in a wide range of socioeconomic groups. You know, many physicians say they don't want to deal with FAS because they don't see it in their patient population. However, if you really look at the literature, it occurs in a wide range of socioeconomic groups and patient populations. Also, think of this as new material because it really is. FAS is a disease actually is only 30 years old. We just celebrated the 30th anniversary in, yeah. in, at a New Jersey conference recently. So there's a lot of new information out there that I think would benefit your patients. And lastly, really try and, if you have time, pay attention to the preventive aspects of this illness. There's, this disease is 100% preventable, and because it's incurable and very costly, the best approach right now is to try and encourage our women patients not to drink during pregnancy. There is really no safe level. There is really no safe time. And we also ought to look at those patients who are at risk for pregnancy that maybe aren't using effective methods of contraception. Maybe they're drinking too much. Maybe that's leading to um, sexual activity that's not protected. Uh, we ought to talk with those people, too, because the rate of unintended pregnancies in this country is very high, 50%. And lastly, focus on your teenage patients, because that's where these bad behaviors get started. If I feel if we can really encourage our teenage patients to develop healthy behaviors early on, we can prevent a lot of the adverse health events that happen in our society, like FAS and other things. Mark, thank you. And, and, and you said if you have time, and I'm, I'm just wondering how much time it takes for a physician who's very busy and, and dealing with managed care and has right. got to get patients through the office, how much extra time does it take to, to, to ask and, and follow up 
on uh, uh, drinking for, for women who are at risk for pregnancy? It really only takes two to three minutes at most. So it, it, it wouldn't be that much of an imposition on a busy physician? I don't think it would be, no. Okay. Well, for me, Mark, the, one of the best things about this project has been the opportunity to work with you. It's been a very genuine pleasure. I'm very sincere about that. So thanks for coming out. Thank you, Danny. You're very welcome.